no, there's no doubt that uh, the rack is real and that Mitch is the guy that, you know, that took him, in my opinion. Welcome to the Hunting Illinois podcast. In this episode, we have kind of a, a unique story that we're going to share. It's a, of an infamous deer hunter and his harvest that really took the, the hunting community, the industry, and the internet by storm. Uh, this harvest occurred in the late 90s, but it's been 20 years now and there's still quite a few unanswered questions there's a lot of rumors about the the authenticity of this harvest and so this is the story of the the mitch rompalo buck and we wanted to to bring that to you so this this story is really full of of intrigue and has again been a topic of discussion among internet forums social media groups and and even my personal deer camps for you know a few decades it's always a story that that gets brought up in in one way or another and while we aren't here to tell you which side of the story to believe uh we did speak to to several key people who have very intimate knowledge of the hunt, of the deer, and of Mitch himself. And we really wanted to, to share this story with you. Curtis, you want to you want to tell us a little bit about uh, who you chatted with? Yeah, this episode is going to be awesome. We talked to Chuck Neese of CSS Bows, and he actually sought out Mitch Rompola. Before he shot the buck in 1998, Mitch Rompola was a really well-known deer hunter. People knew about his successes, and he had uh, Dan Bertalian wrote a, uh, wrote him into his book about bow hunting. He uh, featured Mitch Rompola in that book uh, long before he shot the buck in 98. Curtis and Jason of the Illinois Learn to Hunt crew sat down with Chuck Neese, formerly of CSS Bows. Chuck spent three full days with Mitch right after he shot the big buck in 1998, and he's one of the best ones to talk to about it. To start out, Chuck, I want to know about CSS Bows. So how did CSS Bows come about? You started, you were in the industry with, uh, what was it? You were with uh, Mountaineer Archery, correct? Yeah, I was president of Mountaineer Archery from 89 till <clears throat> till 95. And then uh, we decided to build bows that uh, that were more for the target industry and, and more of a custom type bow. So we started CSS there in 96 and uh, and it, it went really well. And uh, uh, like I said, we had a lot of national world champions. Had a lot of people that liked our boats. Uh, I think the key thing with with Mountaineer and CSS is we were the company that uh, designed and developed the eighty percent let off, which comes into play with Mitch's deer also. You know, so that's that's part of it there. But yeah, at uh, a company we really had a lot of good people. We sold a lot of bows in in, in most of the northern states, and uh, uh, and like I said, it uh, it was enjoyable. The, okay. When did you first meet Mitch? What was your impression? What did you think of this guy? Uh, this is obviously before the, the big buck of 98, but just tell us about that. Walk us through it. Right. Uh, we'd been at a writer's camp in, uh, in Kentucky and there were manufacturers there that were gold tip, uh, a lot of companies, you know, today and, uh, several individuals and, uh, they had mentioned about the Ron Polo buck. So, uh, they gave me the information. Of course, when you hear someone's after a world record bucket, kind of, well, there's only been two of them since 1914. So, but anyway, we wanted to follow up on it. So I got his number and name and in, uh, in 97, I called him up and, you know, uh, told him who I was. Uh, and I said, I'd like to build your boat. And uh, he said he was shooting a boat that Fred Bear had built for him. Uh, it was probably 15 years old <laughs> or better. So, I said, what do you like? He said, I like a short bow. I want it fast and I want it, you know, to where I can hold it for a long time. So that worked perfect with what we made. We made a 70% let off for him that was 34 inches. And, you know, that was, uh, but he also said, he said, if I don't like it, he said, I'll send it back to you. <laughs> so, you know, uh, he got the boat and a few months later, he called and said he loved it. You know, it was considerably faster than the older bows, the round wheels that, you know, that they made back then. And for him to give up Fred Bear's bow, that made me feel pretty good. From Facts About the Rumpola Buck on the Facebook page, Mitch Rumpola, Traverse City, Michigan, on November 13th, 1998, at 747 a.m., bow hunting from a tree stand with a custom shooting system, CSS, signature series compound bow that was later called the Swamp Master, 
uh, 34 inches axle to axle set at 58 pounds with adjustable pro stop set to 30 inch draw with the let off adjusted to 75 percent using a gold tip five layer laminated graphite shaft arrow 55 75 spine full length at 32 inches crown dipped white uh, his broadhead was a gold tip gladiator 125 grain expandable four blades he was using Buck Fe Fever Vanishing Hunter spray and a scent lock suit and uh, had a mock scrape, of course, with the Buck Fever Synthetic scent shot. And the distance of shot was 11 to 12 yards. After the shot, the deer went about 70 yards. Uh, typical whitetail, mature adult, seven and a half years old, biologist aged. The field dressed weight was 263 pounds on a certified scale. Estimated live weight, 300 plus. Antlers, 38 inch outside spread, 216 and 5 eighths inches net typical by a respected panel of official Michigan measurers, Lee Holbrook, Gary Berger, and Al Brown. The bow that, uh, so the Swamp Master, was that made like kind of to Mitch's specifications? Yeah, actually the name uh, came to that. Uh, we built the first one. And uh, as we get into talking about when, when we first talked to Mitch, but uh, the name came out later after, you know, he had, had taken the deer. There was a book written about him called Whitetail Masters. And uh, he was in that book. Uh, I think Dan Bortalin, which was really great author and, and so forth. He, uh, he put the book out and uh, it told about eight or different, you know, whitetail hunters, but it really, you know, honed in on Mitch and his way of hunting in the swamps. And so we, that was really where the, you know where the name came from because he labeled him the swamp master in the book yeah. at that time isn't it true that pope and young record books if it was a, a bow that was greater than was it 65 percent let off they they wouldn't accept it exactly and uh there was an interesting there after the the deer was killed i actually contacted pope and young of course mitch and pope and young had a little bit of a a myth you know, from things that, that it took place. But uh, the fact is, is that, you know, anybody could have said, well, it was 60% or 65. I mean, Mitch was honest about it and said, I killed it with 70%. That has to tell you something about him. And even though, it, you know, it couldn't be world record by Pope and Young, that he was honest enough to say, you know, this bow had 70%. Of course, as we know, uh, on down through history now, it's totally legal to have an 80% bow. Hallelujah. Now, let's go ahead and go to 1998. When did you first hear that the buck was on the ground? Well, uh, Mitch had called me uh, basically probably a week before, he, you know, he had taken the buck and he said he had a 12 days to take it. Um, of course, I was excited to listen to see what happened but he uh he called me on friday the 13th november friday 13th at about 9 30 in the morning and he said i got him that's exactly what he said to me and i said you mean the the big buck he said yes it was the big buck and you could just hear the excitement in his voice i mean of course anybody would have been excited but you know you could tell that he was just tremendously excited and we talked for a few minutes i didn't get to ask a lot of questions he said i've got so many people here in my yard you know, looking at this deer, you know, he said, I've got to get back to it. So he did, you know, and we didn't get to talk then until a few days later, but, uh, and that's when the picture came out and everything started to take place, you know, on the internet. Yeah. Obviously I've, I'd never had the pleasure to meet Mitch. I've watched a lot of his, uh, recorded things. He strikes me as somebody he knows a ton about deer. He doesn't, he's not the best people person. Am, am I right in saying that? You're exactly right. If you saw him in the crowd, you wouldn't, you wouldn't go up and tap him on the shoulder. And, and, uh, and that's a shame because until I got to sit down with him, you know, I kind of felt the same way, you know, he was, uh, he was pretty much standoffish and, and to himself. But once you got to know him, it was just exciting to talk deer hunting with him, but you're exactly right. And that's probably part of the problem. You know, he wanted to avoid any type of uh, public exposure. You know, he just wasn't one into that, you know, to that type of uh, fame. 
For sure. Yeah. And I, it, it's clear when you listen to some of the past recordings that are there that <clears throat> the guy, he knows deer. I mean, every bit of information he gives is dense and I, I liken it. I'm also a trapper and I go to a lot of trapper conventions and there's a guy by the name of Gary Jepson. That's one of the world uh, resources on coyotes. And when he talks about coyotes, it's the same way as when Mitch talks about deer. Uh, even the yeah. things he says under his breath are tidbits of wisdom that most people don't get in their whole life. And it's, it's amazing. Yeah. It's uh well, you imagine spending 200 days a year for three years to get to that buck and he was on public land. It'd be hard to sleep at night, you know, when gun season came in or, or what, you know, and I can, I get nervous thinking about spending that much time and actually drawing down on a deer, you know, after three years of trying to take him, I mean, it just, uh, that would be the adrenaline rush of a lifetime. Absolutely. When did you first know that the deer was not going to be entered in the record books? Well, <clears throat> we'll go back to where I actually went, you know, from our company and myself, I had to find out if this was the real deal. And, you know, if Mitch was the type of individual that we wanted to, you know, to back with our company, because, you know, it's just like in sports or anything else, you know, when you back someone, you, you gain their reputation. And, you know, although I knew he was kind of reclusive, I wanted to make sure everything was right. So, uh, again, I went up and spent three days with him. And uh, I guess uh, we covered everything that, that could be covered. Uh, you know, if we want to go into talking about that, we can. You know, I mean, that's... Sure, uh, yeah, what... what uh... What was the condition of the buck at that point? Was it already mounted? Did you see the sculpt? No, I got to see the rack. I didn't, you know, I didn't spend a lot of time. It was more, uh, I wanted to make sure everything was the way it should be. But at the same token, I wanted to go where he killed it. I wanted to see the people that, you know, everything that I could about it and get, you know, get as much history. And uh, because we had a, what's called an ATA or archery trade show coming up. And we wanted to try to introduce all this there at the show. So, uh, you know, after three days of being with him, uh, I got to see and touch, feel everything that was about. And we, we were behind him 100%. So getting back to your question, when did we know that he wasn't going to score? It was probably the day of the ATA show. Up until that time, you know, he was supposed to come there, bring the rack there. And, you know, here we were all set up had everything ready to go and he didn't show but at the same time we had a uh, a media conference with all the magazines and everyone else and we let them know all the information that we had so you know that was the best we could do at the moment uh, and then later you know it came out that and we can talk about that we, he has a contract with milo hansen and that has a lot to do with him not you know not entering at this time you know as a world record for sure. Yeah. And before I ask you about that specifically, just about the three days you were there specifically. So you were behind them 100%. In your opinion, is there any way that somebody could have faked these antlers? No way. No I matter. Mean, I've shot a lot of deer myself and I've even helped mount some of them. And just to see that I'll call it the awesomeness of this rack you know, and how perfect it is, uh, there's no way that, uh, in my mind, you know, now they have may, may have made a, uh, you know, a replica of it since. I think that may be part of what has taken place, but uh, uh, no, there's no doubt. And after seeing the people, and even now, after the podcast with Craig and them, so many things have come up that we don't have time to talk about, but I mean, people that have saw the deer, people that knew of what took place. So, uh, deer and deer hunting, uh, they did an article, which is some of it in, in the Facebook, but uh, they did a whole story on it and showed Lee Holbrook and all the measures. If people would have seen that magazine, there was no doubt. I mean, they showed everything that could be shown, you know. So, uh, no, there's no doubt that uh, the rack is real and that Mitch is the guy that, you know, that took him, in my opinion. Awesome. Well, it just, uh, so one other question about that is, did you find people who had seen the buck alive before Mitch had taken it? 
Yes, sure did. He took me, and I can't think of the guy's name, but of course it was on the edge of a swamp, and 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 I'll call it a river. But he took me to the guy's place. Mitch lost sight of that deer in July and August. I kind of worried him, thought it might have been hit by a car or something like that. He took me to this guy in the guy's backyard there. He looked across, and he had seen this deer in July, and that's where the deer was. And he'd already planned on hunting himself, you know, and he, he saw that deer, kept track of it until uh, the middle of September. And then the deer moved into the area where Mitch hunted. But yeah, it was kind of neat. The guy had pictures, you know, he even, he watched it with binoculars about every, he said every other day. And there was an individual that was flying out of Traverse City with one of the, I can't think of the dealer's name up there, but they were going to hunt Saskatchewan. And uh, this came out later, but, you know, they were flying and the guy said, man, I don't know why I'm going up to Saskatchewan. He said, there's a world-class buck, you know, right down here below the airport, <laughs> you know, and turns out, it, yeah, so he'd seen it there before. So, you know, uh, a lot of new things have come out that kind of really, you know, tell the tale. Sure. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. that's awesome information. Thank you for that. And so now yeah. you mentioned you mentioned the agreement with Milo Hansen. It was it was really his business partner, I think, right? But so the way I understand yeah. it, basically, Mitch was he had his riff with the commemorative bucks of Michigan. He obviously couldn't uh, put it in Pope and Young at that time. I had heard that he was never going to score it for anything higher than the commemorative bucks of Michigan. Is, is that correct? Or do you think he was gonna, gonna score it before that uh, agreement was signed? Well, I actually talked to John Butler and Milo. I called him up on the phone. I said, you know, Mitch doesn't want to do the shows. I said, you've killed the largest, you know, white tail ever killed in Canada. This is the largest in the United States. I said, you just really need to get together. You go to the shows and, you know, show it. Of course, you know, giving up the world record title. And what happened was see, when we were at the show, they were holding up on doing any of the uh, seminars and showing the buck. You know, I, I would say that buck, you know, brought Milo quite a bit of money. Mitch didn't want to take that away from him, you know. So that's where the contract was really made. And I think that also led to the authenticity because if the buck wasn't real why did you need a contract you know what i'm saying i said it uh yeah. it, it plays to me that you know mitch mitch was that kind of guy though he thought a lot of milo he didn't want the uh you know all the fame with it and uh i think some other things occurred which we can talk about but you know that was the whole thing now i do believe in the contract is that if someone does kill a deer bigger than milo's you'll see the Rampola buck come up. I think that's part of it. Yeah, so that's that's what we're waiting on. There was no sunset clause on that thing. It doesn't expire in 20 years or... <laughs> you know, I didn't get to see it. I know it was there. Uh, and I mean, I'm just telling you, after talking to, you know, to Butler and Milo, uh, those are some of the things that, that we'll know in the future, but I do know that, you know, it couldn't say that it was world record buck. It couldn't say it was the biggest non-typical, you know, and it wouldn't be scored until something. So I'm thinking that something is, you know, that someone beats Milo's record. Sure. How, how disappointing was this to you and the comp and your, your archery company? I mean, this is reminds me of kind of a similar um, the new movie aired that this came out this past year where Matt Matt Damon's trying to get Michael Jordan to sign with Nike. I mean, you had your Michael Jordan pop up out of nowhere. You had you went and found your your guy in the middle of the oh, Michigan yeah. woods well, and he gets the world record and and then all exactly. this drama happens afterwards. I mean, how how heartbreaking was that for you guys? Well, we didn't have to go to AA afterwards or whatever, but it was uh <laughs> you know, it was a big letdown. And and like I said, we actually uh we put a lot of time and effort and money in getting all this going. And, uh, and I can also say that, you know, the odds of him killing your record buck world record buck, the odds of him using my bow were probably even more, you know, compared to all the bows that are out there, you know, nowadays, but, uh, you know, after we got over the fact that, 
and and we didn't really know there for really quite some time what was going to happen. But you know, after we it didn't really hurt our company that much. I mean, there were people that you know uh, I even saw fist fights you know over arguments over the deer. It was uh, amazing how you know how much uh, importance people put on it. You know, I ended up selling my company probably 10 years later, and it, it really didn't affect us that much. I think it probably gave us as much notoriety as it, you know, as it hurt. Okay. But the one thing we did want to do, uh, and I've sent him the information, is I wanted to do something that would let this continue. And we'll talk about that in a minute, but that was getting uh, Mitch and Charleston all together to put together, you know, a print of where that exactly happened, you know, when he took that buck. You still, to this day, stand behind Mitch 100%, correct? Yes. And, you know, uh, with the fact of him not, you know, I guess there was a little rift between us two because, you know, we had really put a lot of time and effort into it. But, no, I mean, I've never said a negative thing. Uh, getting back to the three days I spent with him, I'm telling you for the, we sat down and talked the first day, probably five hours about deer hunting. And that's been one of the best experiences I ever had. I mean, he uh, he's just as excited about it as you or I. And the, the two questions I asked him, you know, one was he went back and if you look in the print there, he killed the, the second buck a few days later. And I asked him, how did it feel compared to the first one? He said the same. <laughs> so that, that tells you a lot about him, too. It, I mean, he probably was the biggest white tail fanatic I'd ever met. I mean, and, but he knew everything that was, I think, that you could know about it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a great endorsement for somebody that's that's been around the industry for a long time. Now, you've told us some stuff already that a lot of people get wrong about the story, but is there anything else that people always get wrong that, that just really frustrates you that you wish people could get right? Yeah. I mean, you take the average individual the or whatever, you know, you're saying, man, if I killed the world record, I would this, 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 and, and 90% of the people would, you know, but Mitch wasn't like 90%. Mitch, Mitch was a guy that, you know, his white tail hunting was his life, still is. You know, I think that he's out there every day enjoying what we all enjoy, and he's not worried about the rest of this stuff. You know, so uh, what I can tell people is, is hopefully one day we will get to see the, the rack, the deer, and we'll get to hear a lot about Mitch and, and everything that took place. But because of jealousy, envy, and we never mentioned one guy, Freeport Press in Michigan, and those people trying to make money off this thing by starting a controversy. Those are the reasons we don't get to see it now. And I'm hoping, you know, someday that that, that, that goes away and, and everybody gets to enjoy probably one of the best whitetail stories that were ever told. Absolutely. Well, well said. Well said. But when's the last time you've spoken to him? It's been quite some time. I did uh, actually have some contact with, uh, w you know, with the, uh, his uh, sons, whatever. And, uh, you know, but I'm still trying to get in touch with Mitch. I hope he gets to see this. I hope, you know, everybody that gets to see this podcast will go to Facebook and look at all the information. Once you look at all of it, you know, there's no doubt that uh, that everything's true to that fact. So, but it's, it's an ongoing story and it's kind of like the, you know, the world record, uh, Jordan, you know, it was killed in 1914, didn't become a record until 1967. So this is probably one of another great white tail legends that, a big bug you know, that will go on for some time. Controversy, huh? <laughs> mm -hmm. you, you guys are in a state where it could happen again. You know, Illinois, Ohio, mm -hmm. a lot of that. So, yeah. Absolutely. That's well, I'm going to do my part. I'm going to try. I'm going to really try to get one bigger than Milo Hansen just so we can see <laughs> this deer. That's. Uh, I hope everyone break, does for sure. Just to, just to break that contract. Yeah. You bet. <laughs> yeah. Which leads me to another thing. A lot of people say the deer was uh, destroyed in a fire. Do you have any reason to believe that's correct? What, his deer? 
Yeah, the big buck. I, I've heard people talk about that on social media that the big buck was destroyed in a house fire. No, no. You know, I think Mitch, as smart as he was at whitetail hunting, he was very smart about his dealings with this. And uh, I think when it all comes out, you'll see that he made a, a wise decision on what to do with it and, you know, how he wanted to live the rest of his life. So, yeah. Yeah. I, don't, I don't think, you know, that story is, uh, is not true at all. It's safe somewhere. Awesome. Did you catch that? Well, I didn't while we were live, but I did while we were processing. And that little wink, I'm not sure exactly what it means, but uh, for some reason, it makes me feel warm and fuzzy that the Rompola buck rack is safe somewhere and that we will be seeing it again sometime in the future. I just hope it is the not so distant future. No, just that uh, I'm really glad to see Curtis and the guys come out and start putting this information together. And in hopes that if I know Mitch is probably looking. So I think if all of us, if we put enough positive energy into it, that can make things happen a little quicker, you know, but uh, I've really enjoyed talking to you. I think what you, you guys are doing are great. More of that would, would benefit everybody. Uh, awesome discussion with Chuck from CSS Bows. He spent three days with Mitch right after Mitch shot the deer because as a sponsor, he uh, basically needed to check into it, make sure everything was okay, make sure everything was legit before he stamped his name, his company's name of approval on the whole thing. So uh, he spent that time with Mitch. He got to see where he harvested the deer. He got to talk to people that saw the deer on the hoof. Awesome discussion with, with Chuck. And then uh, we've had a ton of help from the Mitch Rompola fan uh, uh, group Facebook page and a couple of their moderators and admins have uh, agreed to join us here and they've given us some awesome pictures including some pictures that are maybe unreleased or that i haven't seen hardly anywhere ever before like a color picture of the other big buck that uh mitch rompola shot in 1998 a little bit after the giant buck uh, he shot another nice buck that was actually associating with with the big buck and there's been a uh, podcast or two recently that have dissected the black and white photo of that picture versus the color photo of his giant buck and have thought that those two deer looked remarkably similar. Um, now, when we compared the color pictures together, we did not find that to be the case, but we'll let you be the judge. Another really kind of what I find really intriguing about this, this whole overall story is a quote from an article in Outdoor Life. It was written by Richard Smith, uh, but it's a direct quote, quote from uh, Mitch himself. And it says, although I've shot a good number of trophy bucks in recent years, I haven't entered any of them since 1988. And that means end of the record books. For now, don't expect this one to be treated any differently. It may be entered someday or it may not. And for me, that just really highlights the motivation for for Mitch here it's not necessarily to get this worldwide recognition that he's quote unquote the the you know person here uh for him it's it's you know a a, a more personal I think, connection to to whitetail to the outdoor world and to hunt so I think that's a really impactful quote that kind of really helps set the stage for a lot of the story that that we're going to dive into okay while you're talking about Richard Smith I've got to bring up this book right here this is volume three in the Great Michigan Deer Tales, uh, written by Richard Smith. This contains the, the full account of the Mitch Rampola hunt, the full uh, story be behind that hunt. I won't give away all the details. There's a lot of good stuff in here. Get the book. You can find it on Amazon. Um, I got it right away after I read that same article that you read, Dan. A great article um really good stuff there's been a lot of awesome stuff put out there about mitch we're certainly not the the first ones to do a, a story on a, a buck of this caliber and uh richard smith has got some awesome stuff i definitely recommend you check out the great michigan deer tales the whole set um volume three is the one that covers the 1998 buck but mitch is actually in i think three different uh books from that series so Definitely check out the whole series. Not to get mention, you get to hear about a whole bunch of other cool hunts too. Not just uh, not just about Mitch's, but 
Richard's a great writer. He does a good job in that stuff. And there's been some pretty good podcasts released about it as well. There's another podcast that did a good job of just talking through the story that you can check out is Exodus Outdoor Gear did a podcast called The Most Controversial World Record Buck, the Mitch Rompola Buck. Um, Certainly don't agree with everything that they say there, but they do a great job of kind of going through the story. And it's another good, if this is a story that interests you, feel free to check out not just our podcast, but multiple sources of information and make your own own opinions up because uh, there's a lot of stuff to consider in this one. Yeah, and then talking to those guys, it sounded like everybody was positive and then Mitch may not have been playing ball with them as much as they wanted them to. So he was sitting there and uh, not really inter- getting interviewed or whatever, but then all those magazines and such kind of twisted on him. And then that's when they kind of went negative with it because they got to sell magazines and negative sells just as much as positive, maybe even more. So it's a shame more. that that's kind of, kind of what sounds like what happened. Yeah. To me, that's exactly what happened. Again, we don't want to tell people how to, how to feel, but uh, my personal opinion is that's what happened when, when Mitch wasn't there to give his side of the story and he decided to stop talking to media, media is going to create a story where they think there's a story. And just like you said, Jason, people love negative stories. I, whatever, it's, uh, I guess, one of the bad things about being a human. I don't know. But yeah, you look at the, the news stories and you see one pop up that's like, firefighter saves kitten and the other one pops up that's like oh a whole bunch of people massively mauled like people are clicking on that one i I don't know why but um so i think that's the way it went it just got skewed into the negative and negatives what gets views but people also with it it feeds into it from so many things that we see now in media and have seen it now in decades and really and it was before 98 and it's been after 98 it's been forever so we can think of so many stories out there that we've seen over the years of some type of celebrity or some type of famous person someone who looks like they had it all and then something comes out where they can try to knock them down a peg so you had all this come together in this this crazy buck for this guy and it and curse has said it before in our conversations that it's just a shame that that's what happened because not only did it possibly make this guy go even more into hiding more or less likely to talk to people but we lost all the knowledge that he had because clearly controversy or not this guy knew how to deer hunt and he knew a lot about deer uh and to not have that wealth of information for the past 25 years readily available to talk to him uh is a real shame and a, and a loss to the whole community and it just stinks that the internet and people looking at a photograph and like everyone we talked to the fellows from facebook and and, and they they've been doing a great job of kind of curating the evidence um and they just said that of all the people i've ever seen the buck not one person who saw that buck said it was fake everyone who said it was fake were people that were looking at these weird photos and just were like that rack looks weird and then just went from there and um and then a lot of folks who were kind of throwing stones were also people who he rubbed the wrong way in one way or the other as well like locals in michigan who uh who were stirring it up as well so you get the local people who already don't like him you got people online who are just looking at a photograph and then that's where all the that the non-evidence comes from is just people looking at this at the photos and then to have um everyone else who's seen it say it's real and it's just a shame that this is how it all played out there's nothing more the internet loves than a good conspiracy theory yeah that's true yeah and i had another uh piece of media i want to point out is look up mike avery outdoors on youtube mike avery has got some of the best uh early footage of of mitch because Mitch, um, if you watch some of these past footage, he's not really what you'd call a people person, right? He's kind of the, he wants to be away from people. He wants to be in the woods, but um, he did do just a couple interviews and Mike Avery Outdoors has uh, access to those. So uh, check out his YouTube channel and you can hear straight from Mitch's mouth some of the information that he's learned about deer over his course of hunting. And I got to parallel this to a birding story the best birder who ever lived is, is quite possibly a guy by the name of Ted Parker. Uh, the dude was completely a bird savant, didn't like people. So much uh, didn't like people. One time the uh, World Wildlife Federation had Harrison Ford call him to try to get him to come to a, 
um, convention they were having and he hung up on Harrison Ford. But anyway, Ted Parker spent his life researching birds, kept all this stuff in his journals. He wound up dying early in a helicopter crash in South America and all the information that he had, which nobody has ever had before and nobody's had since died with him. And uh, I, I mean, obviously it's a major shame that he passed away, but it's perhaps equally a shame that all that knowledge that he had is gone. And yeah, Mike Avery Outdoors, another uh, good podcast I'd like to point out for somebody who actually was helped immensely in their hunting journal journey from uh, Mitch Rompola. Check out the Deer Hunter podcast when they interview Troy Pottinger. So Troy is an Idaho whitetail hunter, very accomplished hunter in his own right. And he actually was so into deer, he looked up uh, Mitch Rompola because he read about him in Dan Bertalian's book. And he's like, this guy is awesome. He started being a pen pal with Mitch and Mitch helped him so much immensely. Uh, and, and he goes on and on about these letters that Mitch sent him about hunting tactics and just how he's successful and uh, basically winds up giving a lot of credit to Mitch and he didn't even know the guy. He was just a hunter many, many states away that read about him and, and wound up writing him and, and getting a response. So another cool podcast to check out to get some of that info about Mitch and, and how he's impacted other hunters along the way. Curtis and Jason from the Illinois Learn to Hunt crew sat down with Craig and Mike from the Facebook group, the Mitch Rompola fan page. We got two of the admins, two of the lead people from the Mitch Rompola Facebook group uh, that we're going to be talking with today, uh, Craig and Mike. And I'm going to turn it over to these guys for a little introduction to them and how they uh, came to be a part of the, the Mitch Rompola Facebook page, which if you haven't seen it, uh, really taken off, especially after a couple articles. I think Joe Rogan might have mentioned it on the podcast and obviously the uh, the membership kind of took off, but pretty big, pretty big uh, group you all have there. Uh, yeah, it, uh, it blew up. I joined that group back uh, before Brian actually took it took it over and it was it was really dead there was only a few hundred members um i just was interested in the updates on ron polabuck and i thought i would uh join the group and then uh all of a sudden one day i start seeing the group showing up on my news feed constantly and i got involved with it what was it that happened that started it getting so popular was it the the Ronella rogan interview or was it something else that happened no it actually was before that actually um i would say just a few months before that and i'm not sure to be honest if there was an article printed someplace that might have spawned it but it just it seemed like membership went up like 700 members in a week and then i think a lot of it was there was some people that really discredited Mitch and just uh, talked about all the rumors and it caused a controversy that really drew people in just to pay attention to the controversy. And then I think a lot of people kind of drew their own conclusion from the information that was being shared. Um, what, you know, a lot of it is uh, just speculation. And when the facts started get getting to, uh, out there and, we had uh, some people that actually laid hands on the deer go up on the podcast or on the uh, Facebook group. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that really that really made the difference when people in the know joined the group. I I think Gary, when Gary Berger came on, when the controversy was going back and forth, and his first statement was, "I was one of the three that scored the Ron Polabuck, and it's real." So I, I think that's when it really started going. And then when uh, Richard P. Smith also uh, ran his article, it took off. It grew so fast. That's why we ended up uh, all getting together and add more people just to handle the websites. Yeah, you all have even had uh, Mitch's son on the on the Facebook page there, Kevin, correct? Now, Kevin has been in contact with Brian Lee. And, uh, and, it, it, and there, when Brian, I came to the page kind of like Mike did. 
same same type thing. I, I was looking at some Mitch Rampola stuff, uh, and I knew Stan Banker at the time was the president at that time. So we kind of started getting people involved. He was the president of uh, uh, Commander Bucks of Michigan. So he had made a statement about, you know, that he had backed the scores whenever he's asked for it. So these people came to the page and it came in. And, and that's when uh, that, that, like Mike had said, when the controversy started and the people started showing up who were actually involved when the page really took off. And uh, Richard P. Smith was one who was a big contributor. And uh, and his article, I think, spurred as much as anything. The, the guy who looked at the picture of the big buck from 98 and then the buck he shot uh, that Mitch shot later that same year, who, of course, was one of the three bucks that were all together hanging out together. And he points to similarities in the face. Um, and, I, you know, you can't deny the pictures do look similar, but I'm sitting here thinking those three bucks were together, shot from the same stand, the same spot, the same year very high likelihood they share a parentage yeah the, the the problem was was taking it off a black photo and trying to compare it to a, not a really good photo of mitch's deer either at the time sure. but we are in possession of that color photo now and uh i can provide that if you'd like we haven't put it out yet but we can provide that and uh you, you do it and i there's some similarities but there's some distinct differences you know, ear shape, etc. And uh, if you see the color picture, it's a little more self-explanatory. Well, if you, if you can ask Mike and and him and I both agree on this, actually all of us do. Brian too is is the photographs. You can do whatever you want with a photograph; it doesn't tell a story. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, we've had to. I call them photography biologists and everything else on the line. And Mike has gone on a different uh, perspective on that. But uh, you, Mike even put together a collage. And, and I added to it, we actually posted doe antler deer because they're antler deer no matter what, right? And we put antler does on there. And actually one was a breeding doe. And it's funny, none of the experts picked up on it that no a doe or a buck from a set of antlers because they want to attack Mitch on other photos that is deer or does with antlers attached. So, you know, we, oh, we've wow. tried to get it every, every situation possible. We try to research it. We try not to put stuff out less we know. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and, and we have a lot of stuff we can't share. So we've been asked not to. Mm -hmm. To me, logically, just thinking of someone, of, 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 if, if a person was going to do a hoax, they would, that would be a photo that came out before the hoax, not after the hoax. <laughs> like if it was the exact same deer. I mean, if it was the deer that he shot a year before or earlier in the season, and then mm -hmm. he came out with another deer that was ginormous, like that would make sense to me. But to have it after the fact and have that be up, for scrutiny is silly. Like that does not seem smart at all. Yeah. Well, here's the thing too about anything being fraud or fake is they readers and deniers a little bit because no matter after 25 years the story has remained the same from everybody involved, and it got to the point we we made the page so people could come forward like Chuck and and Lee and and hopefully Mitch one day would say hey you know here I am this this is my story of it but. Uh, mm -hmm. If he was making a fake, why would he make it exaggerated wits and the stuff we did instead of making it? Let's say I, I follow a little copy of the Milo Hansen book as far as, as rack design and the rest of it. Why would you make something that sticks out so far <clears throat> and would people would pick up and go, wow, that, that's a wide rack and be the first indication that, oh, it can't be real. Right. Why would you even go down that road? It don't even, It doesn't make sense from a logic standpoint. It would be the least goofiest looking rack. It would be the most... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you try to make it look as realistic as possible. You wouldn't make it look goofy at all because the more goofy it looks, the more questionable you're going to have on it. Well, one thing we learned on the on the site when those come up, and it gets repeated a lot, and I repeat a lot of the information, and I get I get I get jumped for that. But we have a lot of new members come on, and and they don't take the time to go through the featured section or the photo section, which there's a ton on there. So those come on. If you go through the photo section, there's plenty of examples. The ear thing was a big thing too. There's plenty of examples. They want to pick on the one with Mitch with the ears down over here, with the one sitting in a truck with the tape measure across it, or the other one with Al Brown, who was one of the scores who unfortunately has passed. Uh, the ear looks perfectly normal. So, you know, they want to pick and choose when it comes to denying it, but they want to ignore the stuff that shows the facts that it is real. So, 
really when it comes down to it does anyone who actually saw the deer question the deer mike no nobody that i'm aware of everyone that had firsthand knowledge of that deer you know 25 plus years ago say still today it's as real as it was then and um you know i i have a story i'd like to share um i had a, a friend a, he had a lease in Iowa and he was out there bow hunting and he was also good friends with Mitch Rompola because, you know, Mitch was the guy back in the nineties. Uh, he left his lease in Iowa to come home to Michigan to see that deer the day after Mitch killed it. Um, when I talked to him, I said, well, I'm already hearing uh, guys like Craig Calderon are, are saying that it's not real. And he said, Mike, if Mitch Rompola tells you he killed a buck, he killed a buck. He said, that guy don't have to cheat. Exactly. Yeah. Well, the, the point that they, the deniers make is, well, they were all his friends. Well, Mitch did know most of them because he was scoring chairman for Commemorative Bucks. And that would be Lee Holbrook. Uh, uh, Gary Berger and Al Brown, and, and they are in a general area, Mitch, but they've all continued to score for years. Their reputations are undeniably good, you know, and uh, like one of the stories about a denier on the page, it, you know, it's fake, it's that, and Gary come on the page, but he responds to one of Gary's posts that, yeah, you know, I didn't believe the deer, but I drove five hours to have my for you to score my son's deer. I, I just find that ironic that he don't want to believe Mitch's deer, but he'd go to Gary, who was Mitch's friend, to score his deer. So his son's deer because it, it made uh, Boone and Crockett. So, it, it, and a lot of people have come forward now. Even just here lately, uh, a, a gentleman on the on the page came on and said that. He was at a, uh, the year before Mitch took the deer, he was at a seminar uh, scoring deer with Gary and they had broke, they'd broken for lunch and uh, Gary got a phone call. I happened to be from Mitch and it must've been at the end. And he had told Gary that he, well, he wasn't able to close the deal on the big deer. And Gary told him, ah, that's a friend of mine. He's talking, he, he's uh, stalking a deer that probably, you know, a rival the world record, but he, he, he hasn't been able to close the the deal this year so it, it, it's on there i actually added it to the feature section so there's plenty of those harry conger the butcher who came forward never knew mitch at all before he killed that deer mitch was looking to get the deer weighed came to the shop that terry was working at uh all he had was a floor scale he couldn't hang it terry went out and seen the deer uh and all the people that witnessed the deer too so you know he came forward what's in it for terry nothing you know it, uh so and there's plenty of those there's there's people that uh, that uh, a guy and his wife that had seen the deer before. People that have had pictures of deer before. Uh, the farmer that that, uh, that that Chuck end up uh, going to visit to validate the deer for his business. You know, had pictures of the deer. So there's plenty of things before, at kill time and after kill time. That thing and uh, I, like I said, you got it. Biology's uh, a biology way uh, aged. I don't see how it gets past that and not being a real deer. Yeah. And it came back as seven and a half uh, years old. So it, yeah. uh, it, everything adds up to. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Like the promoters of the Milo Hansen buck and Craig Calderon, who was the current competition for Mitch in the state of Michigan at the time, those guys came out publicly trashing Mitch's name and bringing up all kinds of stuff. And I think that had a little bit to do with Mitch kind of stepping away saying, you know, I'm not perfect and I really don't need my whole family drag, you know, drug through the mud. And uh, that's about the time Mitch went silent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, they posted or uh, did some articles, mostly small ones, but their quotes went into big, uh, big magazines like deer and deer hunter and, and stuff like that. And that's what started raising the controversy. And I think that was a little bit irresponsible of uh, Deer and Deer Hunter from the get-go. They 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 were supposed to get some exclusive uh, interviews about the buck. And I think at one point, 
Mitch became unreachable. He disconnected his phone because his phone wouldn't stop ringing. Uh, and and that came from Kevin. I, I'm hearing that third third person, but uh, I'm told it came from Kevin that they literally had to have their phone turned off within a couple of days. And so when uh, Deer and Deer Hunter couldn't get their interview, they spun the story from positive to negative. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And the Free Press did the same thing. There was a reporter with the Free Press and uh, he had started on a positive note. And then when Mitch kind of shut it all off, he, he went to the negative side too. And actually it's in Richard's book. I don't know if you read or not. Mitch's quote on, uh, he had gotten 60 phone calls the first night when the book went out and, and he originally just contacted a local news station there in Traverse city. And, uh, Lee Holbrook actually told me that he had heard about the deer being killed on the radio when he was driving out to Kalkaska or something. And, and basically that's how I kind of found out about it was, you know, it was announced there and a few articles here. And, and then the people in the hunting world that go, that I kind of knew myself, you know, started saying, Hey, do you hear about Rampola? And, and if, if you knew Rampola at all, there's stories behind Rampola at the time. And I met Mitch at a couple of seminars. I don't know him personally. We don't talk, but, uh, if anybody was going to do it here in Michigan, he was one of the guys that was going to go do it here in Michigan. So I had an archery shop at the time and I talked to a lot of, a lot of uh, industry professionals and representatives from all kinds of uh, archery equipment. And when it, the buck first came out, there was a few people that actually seen it or talked to somebody who's seen it. And so the feedback I was getting was it's absolutely 100% real, no doubt about it. And then Later on, it turned into, well, now we're hearing some stories that there might be something about it. And so for, for even me at that point, not knowing him, I'm, I'm starting to have my doubts. But then when you actually look at the reasons why people think it's not real, it's all speculation. Nobody has any proof that the deer is not real. And one of the things we did, uh, what's been about a year ago, I think, in a Craig, when I, I did freedom of Info information request Correct. for the Michigan DNR and the Michigan state police. Anybody who is screwing deer horns on a deer, as many as he's being accused of is going to have a pattern. He's going to have contact with law enforcement over poaching or illegally tagged deer or something. Altering game. Every, yeah. Something. And, and between the, the tra uh, Grand Traverse County um, Court, Michigan State Police, and the Michigan DNR, they have no contact with Mitch Rampola. And I, and I did the request from 1980 to 2000 and I think 2008 because you have to put a time on what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Those those came back. I got emails back, and they said we have no record of any contact with Mr. Rampola. So that solidified it for me. I said, out of all the people that I've run into and know that have been poachers, they've been caught multiple times. It's not a one-time thing, and they all get caught. There's no way this guy did it for 40 years and didn't get caught. He had quit putting bucks in the books. Remember the bucks? So I have. 1988 was his last entry, you know, and, and some of his writing stuff, he explains why it was no longer about the trophy. It's about what he does. But so since 1988, so the, the, the bottom fell out kind of like what Mike said when he decided not to go into Boone and Crockett. Right. But he's never put a buck in Boone and Crockett. So I, I don't know why this one would be different. I mean, it, it, and through all this stuff too, we can even throw that 98 uh, buck out of the way. I'd sure like to see what from 98 till present day, what, Mitch is, is complete. And we've lost, we've lost all that just because of the attacks and the hate and the greed. Oh, is Mitch gone forever? I don't think so. I, I, I never, I never say never, especially when it comes to hunting and the rest of the stuff, but maybe when he's done, you know, they'll say, yeah, here it is, you know, put it out there. Who, who wouldn't want to sit and talk to him for an hour? For real. Do, do, no, do we know, do we know how old he is at this point? Uh, I think he just turned 74 or 73. Okay. I think he turned 74 last fall. 
did the kids say if he's still hunting currently or, or what's his last person uh, i talked to had contact with mitch said he's taken bucks the last 10 years wow so if, if you really want to look at the 98 buck <clears throat> photographs videos before witnesses before the deer was taken a year before stuff all the stuff it's probably it's probably the most documented big buck ever if you really want to look at it uh uh, uh world record wise or world class wise as anybody because as you see a lot of world class deer are, are killed by accident more than on purpose and uh if you if you really go back and look and, and like i said go go through the page or really research uh the people that that uh saw the deer alive and and taken is uh why would they make how can you make a story start happening a year before you take the deer uh, and, and it, it 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 all goes to the legitimacy of what mitch did so and, and mike can testify to the fact that mitch still drives the same truck as as he has yes, with he the deer in the back of it I, I was literally i drove by his house two weeks ago and that truck was in his driveway so the rumors that went around uh there was so many the x-ray one was a big one and all that and mitch turned down money to have the deer x-ray so so that didn't happen uh no they what happened was craig calderon and someone else and this was after he, he decided not to put it in the book he wasn't going to give it to boone and crockett uh they offered to put ten thousand up to uh to a charity for him and uh <laughs> And and it, it just never went anywhere. He was never personally offered any money. Uh, Kevin testifies to that fact, too. Plus, we ran that x-ray uh, thing. I, I think I posted the poll on the page. Uh, would an x-ray finally make you a believer? Or something to that effect. <laughs> and, uh, and, and when it first started... There was a couple yeses, but then it took off. Well, we need DNA. And then the next one was, oh, which doesn't prove it didn't come from a deer farm. So, you know, if Mitch would have, and who knows, maybe he did have an X-ray. Uh, we've heard rumors of that too, but it, it still what it still wouldn't cure the uh, the dark side of hunting that's out there. Like you said, you know, all we did is we've come to the page, we have put known the known facts. Was it scored by? A Pope and Young score, yes. Was it by Commemorative Buck score, yes. Was it by Boone and Crockett score, yes. Did they sign and, and give the score, uh, uh, the sheet to Mitch when they were done to uh, to push forward? So Mitch would have had to put his entry fee, push the score sheet up, and then have it panel view. Uh, 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 Stan Banker at the time, who was president of Commemorative Buck, who's part of the uh, fan, fan page, uh, he said they would have put a panel together and scored the buck and, and, and entered it at that time. But he also validates all the scores that he stands behind the scores for what they do. You know, so, you know, uh, you know, you want to talk about his uh, hunting ethics. Uh, Gary Berger told another little story on the page about they were up in the UP uh, actually hunting together at one time and there was a coyote. So they're, they were talking about who was going to shoot this coyote. And Mitch brought up, you guys got a fur bear license or, have a license to shoot that coyote no he goes then you're not shooting the coyote so you know it, it, and it's funny is you talk to people who are close to mitch or have known mitch or been involved anyway not one person has a bad word to say about mitch he's he always seemed to put himself out for them you know lee holbrook has a real good story on that you know and uh he talks about that when he when he came on it's on the page too and he wrote up his whole thing about scoring the deer that day and uh, I, I got another little thing of, about it so I, I mentioned Brian Schubach before we got on here, the Schubach uh, 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 sporting goods out in Jackson. And Brian's a, a really accomplished archer and hunter in his own right. And uh, he was going on a plane. He got on a plane and he was flying to Saskatchewan for a hunt. And he was sitting next to a gentleman and, uh, and they were talking about going to Saskatchewan to hunt. And the gentleman said to him, I don't know why I'm going to Saskatchewan. I have a world-class bucket. On, on my property and, and Brian says you do and he goes yeah so he took a picture out and showed it to Brian and Brian swears to this day it was Mitch's the buck that Mitch took so you know it's stuff like that comes forward and uh it, it just lends to the credibility of the whole thing 
is was there an outcome to this besides what's already happened that you would prefer to see like like yeah. is there anything that would be like ideal the, the, the happy ending for this whole story like what would that look like uh where does, does it need one I, well i i don't know what would end it like i said we uh we kind of uh covered that a little bit on questions about well would an x-ray do it for you no I guess that you would have to come forward and put it in a book to really convince everybody, you know, hundred percent. And I still don't think you would. Then, it, then he would still say he took it from a game farm. So as far as the 98, uh, as far as we're concerned, uh, all the evidence po uh, uh, points to it being uh, legit. And I truly believe that. And, uh, and, and as, as far as 98, I, I we're just going to have to live to what it is right now. I think the happy ending for me, is that someday we we get to hear from Mitch, we get to hear some of his tactics, we get to hear some of his stories that we've missed out on. And I don't care what happens with the buck from 98, but I want to hear more words about deer come out of Mitch Rampola's mouth. That's the happy ending for me. Yeah, I agree with that. We want to give Brian Lee credit too for picking the site back up. Like I said, when when uh, Mike was saying how he got to site, I basically did the same thing. I was looking up some Rampala stuff and, uh, you know, the site came up on Facebook. And I think when I went looked at it, it was six or eight hundred. I may even I joined it at that time or, you know, or, but it hadn't been active in, I'll say, a, quite a few years. So I just kind of passed it off. And then the same thing, it, it, it started getting active and came up. So I, I got on and I started getting myself involved in some some talk. So Brian had kind of messaged me said, hey, you know, what do you know and all that stuff? And, and some of the stuff I knew and some of the stuff I found, I shared with Brian. And that's how Brian and I actually got friends. And <laughs> we had taken off for a long time before Brian even, before both of us even talked to each other directly, you know. And uh, but Brian's really one that picked the site back up when it was basically dead and and took off. And, you know, he wrote the introductory to the thing and why the page is what it is. And uh, so he he deserves a lot of credit and and. and and I'm glad he asked me to be part of it at the time. And uh, and it, it's really grown. And it's, like I said, it got so busy, so we brought the other people on. And one of the moderators on there, he was he was on the fence pretty much for a while. But after you got involved and seen it was Kim on, now, now he's a moderator. So, Wow. That was a lot of awesome information, most of which I didn't know before we started this whole Mitch Rampola journey. Uh, we were so lucky to get some of those photos that uh, I've never seen before. And maybe most of you have never seen before either. Get to talk to Chuck after a long time. I think it's really cool that, that his story stayed the same. And after this long of a time, he no longer is even a part of CSS Bows. He sold it. Uh, he's got no incentive to back up this story other than that it's the truth and he justly believes that the true story needs to be served so huge thanks to chuck niece for for really pouring his heart out and telling us his story uh his time he spent with mitch and, and again a big thanks to the mitch rompola facebook page got to encourage everybody to check out this facebook page they've got a ton of awesome content in their featured sections most of these pictures you can look up there uh, and they get new pictures all the time. You can also read testimonials from Mitch's family members and other people that seen the deer. They've got uh, a guy named Terry on there that actually worked at the butcher shop that weighed the deer on the certified scale. So he got to see the deer, handle the deer at a butcher shop uh, as long, along with a whole bunch of other people when it was on the hoof. and. Of course, just like Jason said, not a single one of them had any doubts on the authenticity of the deer. Um, but huge, huge thanks to, to Mike and Craig of the Facebook group for all their help, not only connecting us with Chuck, but also supplying us with these awesome pictures, awesome stories, and, uh, and yeah, all that good information. And if you enjoyed the, this edition of the, the Hunting Illinois podcast, this is quite a, a departure from our, our normal topics of discussion, but this is kind of a direction we'd like to go with, you know, an occasional episode where we kind of dive into a public interest or a hunting controversy type story like this, give our thoughts, provide some background, and and again, bring in some some people who are intimately familiar with with whatever that topic or story is. Uh, but again, if you're you're new to this podcast, uh, we, we try to put out a podcast every two weeks or so, um, and with hunting season getting underway, 
away, we're really going to focus on some more strategic aspects of hunting. The, the next episode is actually going to be one of my favorites. We're really going to dive into to the science of rut, what triggers rut, what, what physiological changes occur in deer, and how does that impact their, their deer behavior. So if you're interested in learning more about hunting, uh, hunting in Illinois, or just kind of hunting in general, uh, subscribe to our podcast, check out our, our YouTube page, our Facebook page. Um, we host in-person workshops all across the state of Illinois designed to get you prepared uh, to hunt. So if you're brand new to the outdoors or you're, you're somebody who's hunted for a decade or two, uh, we have something for you. So, so give us a, a look on those different platforms and we'll see you out in the woods. Everybody have a safe hunting season and, uh, and there might be another one out there. Just keep your, keep your eyes alert.